Hi, everybody. Let me pray, and then we'll get going. Father, thank you for, again, for the time together, the chance to open up John. and uh, We're blessed by it every time we open it, and we trust that will happen again as you continue to speak to us. Do so tonight, please, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, before we get going, let me uh, uh, announce we will not have Bible study next week, next Wednesday. So it is the week leading up to Labor Day weekend. Ian will be gone. Uh, so you can come and sit in here, whatever. Uh, but this part won't happen. So you can just sit in here till 8 o'clock and... Yeah, yeah, we, we can do that. We'll have those on. and um, But then we'll come back uh, the week after and then we'll, we'll go straight through to mid-November and, and be done then. So tonight we're going to look at uh, the last section of John 4. So go ahead and go to the end of chapter 4, and then we will do all of chapter 5. Because again, what we will, we're going to start moving here. Uh, the last couple of weeks have been larger passages. This is certainly the case as well. Uh, we will do, um, there are the seven signs and the seven discourses, the, the long teachings in the first half of John. Uh, we're doing sign 2, sign 3, and discourse 3. So two miracles and then a long teaching. So we'll go to the first miracle, chapter 4, starting in verse 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he, he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So we start there in verse 46. He's come back around full circle. He was in Cana in chapter 2 for the miracle of water to wine. He's back there again. And he encounters this official uh, that's the term that was used for someone who served a king. So this is a, a Gentile, so he's not Jewish. He's a Gentile Roman officer who likely works for King Herod. So this is an outsider uh, that doesn't have this religious background that the Jews have. He's come from Capernaum, which is about 16 miles north of Cana. So he's come quite a distance. Remember, they're walking, uh, so he's not in a car. So this is, this is quite a ways to have Jesus, uh, ask Jesus for this healing. Now, again, you have to pick up on themes of what John is doing. In chapter 3, he dealt with Nicodemus, a Jewish teacher. In chapter 4, he dealt with a Samaritan woman. And now he deals with a Gentile Roman officer, which would represent then the, the world outside of Judaism. So he's done the Jews, the Samaritans, and Rome. This is the world. So John has, it, it, over the course of just a couple of chapters, taught us that Jesus serves the world. He ministers to the entire group of people that comprise the planet. There's nobody that's out uh, he welcomes anybody and everybody to himself. So the man is in a terrible spot. His son is at the point of death, and he asks for this miracle. Will you come and heal my son? And Jesus' response to him seems a little harsh. Unless you see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Well, he's not yelling at this guy in particular. Because in verse 48, when he says, unless you see signs and wonders. The you is plural. 
So he's not speaking just to this man. He's speaking to Galileans in general, the, the whole region. Because if you remember where we ended last week, verses 43 through 45, he comes into the region of Galilee and they welcome him. But why did they welcome him? They welcome him because he can do signs. He, he can do miracles for them. Not because they believe in who he is or that he's this great Jesus. You can do stuff for me. So now here's this Galilean, uh, but who's Roman coming to him. So he's kind of indicting the entire region. All that you're after are signs and wonders. All that you want are the miracles. You don't really want me. They had failed to see that these signs that Jesus was doing pointed to the truth of his identity. You know, miracles aren't just for the sake of doing cool parlor tricks. Uh, that's not the purpose of signs. It's so that you can know the identity of the one who can do them. So it's not that he can do cool stuff. It's that he is the Son of God. That's its purpose. So this isn't to be taken that signs are negative or that miracles are a bad thing. That's not the case at all. John uses them in his gospel to help people believe. Again, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 12, verse 50 is called the book of signs for John because he records these seven signs. So I've got all these verses here for you that let you know the purpose of Jesus doing signs and miracles is so that people will believe. So these are good things, uh, wonderful, helpful things. So he's, he's not indicting miracles themselves. He's indicting the people who only care about those. Now, uh, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, record a similar yet different uh, miraculous account. Uh, one is in Matthew 8, and the same story is recorded in Luke 7. Uh, it is Jesus healing the servant of a Roman officer, not his son. And that's the one where the, the officer sends word to Jesus, heal my, my servant, he's a valuable servant. And Jesus says, I'll go and do that. And the, the officer says, I'm not even worthy to have you in my house because I understand what it's like to be under authority. Uh, I give orders and I receive orders. So all you have to do is say the word and I know he'll be healed. Uh, so that's not this story. This is a different account, but they do have a lot of similarities. Uh, verse 50, go, your son will live. So he heals him from a distance. He's not there in the flesh uh, at their home or wherever he may be. And Jesus has done this before. Again, in Matthew 8, you've got the, the slave of the centurion that is healed from a distance. Matthew 15, you have the Phoenician woman's daughter. She's healed from a distance. So he doesn't even have to be there. He doesn't have to touch them or lay hands on them. His words have the power to heal, uh, which is what happens when he says, your son will live. That's not a prophecy. That's not Jesus saying, you know what, I know he's going to get better, so just go on home, it'll be fine. It, those words are what heal him, because that's proven in the rest of the story, isn't it? What hour was he healed? At seven, it was one o'clock in the afternoon. That's a, apparently exactly when Jesus said this. So there's a direct correlation between the time of this guy's healing and when Jesus said these very words. Uh, and again, back in, uh, down in verse 54, it's a sign that Jesus did. So this isn't him just prophesying, oh, it'll be fine, I, I know this ahead of time. It's him actively healing this boy. And th this phrase, your son will live, gets repeated in verse 53, letting us know that the purpose of this sign in particular is to reveal that Jesus has power over life itself. So it's repeated, your son will live, your son will live which we're getting ready to deal with this truth that Jesus has power over life. Uh, chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So again, you've got a miracle that is connected to the teaching that comes after it. There's a sign, and then there's a discourse. So this sign is setting us up for what Jesus is about to teach on in chapter 5. The next miracle is going to do the same thing as well. 
Now, notice, again, the, the, the language gets pretty specific about the progression of this official's faith. Uh, he, he starts uh, by, he believes enough to ask Jesus for help. Uh, he, he doesn't know if Jesus is going to agree to heal. Uh, he may not even know anything other than Jesus' reputation. This guy has the power to heal. He's healed before. He changed water to wine. That's pretty cool. If he can do that, maybe he can heal my son. So it's a very elementary level sort of faith. All he knows is, I need help. Maybe that guy can provide it. By verse 50, he's progressed. He believes and he obeys. He believes what Jesus said and then does what Jesus said to do. Go home. Go and your son will live. That's hard to do, isn't it? Like, well, you're not even going with me. Like, I, I came to get you to go to my house to heal my son, but that's an act of faith to leave the presence of the one who can heal, trusting in the fact that he's already done the healing work just by the words that he said. So it, his faith is growing in that he's willing to trust that I, I can do what Jesus said to do. Then by the time we get down to verse 53, uh, he and his entire household now believe. They've seen the effects. They've seen the work that Jesus can do. So his faith has grown, which again prepares for what Jesus is going to teach here in the back half of chapter 5. Now, verse 54, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Now, this is only the second sign that John has recorded for us. He records these seven signs. There are far more that Jesus did. John's list is not an exhaustive list. John purposely chooses these because they're linked to teachings that Jesus gave. Uh, so there are more things that happen. So in between uh, John 2 and the end of John 4, uh, Jesus has been in Jerusalem. He's been at a feast and apparently has done some signs, but John just didn't record them. Uh, chapter 2, verse 23 now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So he's doing miracles everywhere he goes. We just don't have record of all of them. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus acknowledges, you've been doing stuff that we don't know how to explain uh, chapter 4, verse 45, uh, when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he's, he's doing cool stuff when he's in Jerusalem, but we don't have that record, at least in John. So that's sign number two. Chapter 5 starts with sign number three, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, uh, which he doesn't name, and we don't know which feast it is. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who's the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. 
This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So we're entering into a stretch of John that is escalating conflict between Jesus and the Jews. Again, the first 12 chapters, all of these signs, the, it, that section ends at the end of chapter 12 with this overarching statement that the Jews wholesale reject Jesus. So he's building his case that the religious elite have rejected their Messiah. And in chapters 5 through 10, uh, it's what's called the, the festival cycle. So we're going to see multiple festivals, uh, Jewish festivals coming around, and Jesus uh, in particular doing things and teaching things and performing miracles in uh, these festivals that really uh, help set some cool context for what he says and what he does. But I want you to notice verse 4. And as you turn there, you notice there is no verse 4. It's been removed from your Bible. For most of you, it will be in a footnote down at the bottom. Those little tiny print words at the bottom, they do matter uh, because we read that entire passage and I bet you didn't catch that there was no verse 4. There's a reason. So this is the field of biblical criticism that uh, looks at the ancient manuscripts and you know, how old are they and how trustworthy are they and you know, do they line up? You know, how confident are we that you know, this Bible is the original Bible? And uh, this is one of those arguments that non-Christians will give. You can't trust the Bible. It's been you know, transmitted person to person, person to person, person down through the generations. And it's obviously got errors in it. Uh, that's not true. Uh, there are a handful of places uh, where scholars look at the original manuscripts. We have about 25,000 Greek manuscripts uh, from different eras, and they'll look and they'll compare, you know, because older is better. Older equals more accurate because uh, it's closer to the, the time. Um, in fact, uh, the, the oldest of the New Testament, we have a fragment of the Gospel of John that's dated to about 100 A.D. Uh, that's, you know, within a decade or so of John writing this. Uh, we've got a, a portion of uh, one of those early copies, possibly even the original. And uh, these handful of places, over the years, scribes, th those who were hand copying the manuscripts, you know, they didn't have the printing press. Uh, they're, they're not photocopying the pages of Scripture. They didn't have crossway publishers that you can get on and you can buy uh, a copy of the Bible. If you wanted a copy of a manuscript, you had to pay someone to hand copy it for you. Uh, they were very, very expensive. In fact, only the, the super wealthy uh, had, uh, even like the Old Testament scrolls, only wealthy people had those. Uh, only synagogues in large cities had actual scrolls um, because it was so expensive to have one because it was handwritten. Well, over the years, uh, in some of the margins and in some of the notes, the scribes, with good intentions, I believe, would insert little notes or they would correct what they thought was a spelling error, uh, because there, there are some words that are very close. Uh, you know, one, one letter looks like a different letter, and you know, the way that they would do this was called an ascriptorium. Uh, there'd be a room, and there'd be you know, 10 monks you know, copying all this, and there'd be one person reading the text, and you're just copying as they read. Well, words run together, and... You switch out one letter for another, and all of a sudden, this manuscript doesn't say what that manuscript says. It's very, very common, very simple. Well, verse 4, scholars look at this and believe that some helpful scribe somewhere along the way uh, inserted a nice little note to help us understand what was happening with this water. Because it's weird, right? Uh, the water stirs up, and if you get in first, you get healed. That sounds strange. So verse 4 uh, says this, uh, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Well, scholars take that out because in the 
original manuscripts, it's not John's language. Every biblical author has their own style and grammar and language that they use. Uh, for example, uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Uh, Peter wrote both, but the Greek is night and day difference. The Greek in 1 Peter is some of the best in the entire New Testament because Peter didn't write it. Peter dictated it. And amenuensis wrote it down. It's what they would call uh, a secretary. Wrote it down, dictated as he dictated the letter. Uh, second Peter, Peter absolutely wrote because it is the Greek of an uneducated fisherman who doesn't understand classical language and grammar structure. A fisherman wrote it. Uh, so they're very different, but they're both from him. Well, John has language that he uses, grammar that he uses, and the, that little section does not fit with the rest of the book. We will have this conversation again when we get to the beginning of chapter 8 with a woman caught in adultery because we'll have to talk about whether that should be there or not because scholars debate whether it should be. Uh, so we'll have this conversation again uh, and, and why it's left in there versus some other ones that are, are pulled out into a, into a footnote. So what this scribe did was simply let us in on the prevailing legend of the day. The legend is that there's an angel that comes down and stirs the water in this pool, and whenever he stirs the water, if you're the first one in, you get healed. Well, cool. Now it's a race of who can get in the water. Now you've got disabled people throwing elbows at one another to fight to get in the water. Uh, you know, it, it is not a surprise that the legend centers around angels. Jews were fascinated by angels. Uh, they loved angels, uh, elevated angels to a very high position, which is why the New Testament book of Hebrews purposely lowers angels. Because it's written to Christians who came out of a Jewish background who had a very high view of angels. And the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is above angels. Angels aren't that big of a deal. They're just ministering servants uh, to those whom Jesus has saved. They didn't do anything. Jesus is the one who did everything, so he lowers them on purpose. So that's all that's going on here is there's this legend that uh, you know, this is what an angel is doing in the water. Uh, so early witnesses uh, say that the water in this particular pool was red, meaning that it had minerals in it. So it was believed to have healing property, properties and even may have had uh, healing properties. And it was likely fed by an intermittent spring, which is why it was occasionally stirred up. The spring opens, a flood of new water comes into the pool, the water stirs up, and they start to believe if I get in first, I get healed. Uh, cool little legend, funny little thing. It's not biblical. It's why they took it out, uh, and, and rightly so. So that's what's going on with verse 4. It's why it's not there. Uh, it's not a huge deal. It happens from time to time. Uh, verse 5 identifies this man as an invalid. It's the Greek word for disabled. So there's something wrong with him physically. Uh, it's, it's certainly impacting his mobility. He can't get into the water first. Uh, so he, he can't move quickly enough. Uh, somebody's always getting in the water before he does. Uh, so he can't be healed. And he's been there for 38 years. That's tough. And you got to love the Bible gives us such little details like that. He's been there for 38 years which emphasizes for us the gravity of his illness. Like, this is somebody who's likely tried other stuff before, 38 years. And it also emphasizes the genuineness of the healing. Because everybody knows this guy. He's been there for 38 years. Uh, if there was somebody in town who was disabled, who lived on a street corner and lived there for the last 38 years, everyone in town would know him. We would know his name. Uh, we'd all have, would have helped at some point or another. It would be somewhat well known in town. That's the case here. Uh, this happens again in Acts chapter four, uh, verse twenty-two, where the the, the Bible emphasizes uh, this man whom is healed had been disabled for forty years, because they're highlighting, hey, this is legit. Everybody knows that this guy's been disabled, and now he's not. Uh, verse six. Jesus saw him lying there, knew that he had already been there a long time. So we're talking about some divine foreknowledge here. Jesus knows 
his background without ever having known him before. Uh, we've already seen this uh, in chapter 1, verse 48 with Nathaniel. Uh, you know, I saw you under the tree before you came. Um, I mean, I, I know stuff about you, Nathaniel. We saw it in chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. He, he knows she's had all these husbands, knows that she's living with a guy that she's not married to. Again, th this is Jesus' divine side coming out. And notice this man laying here uh, did not ask for help. He did not ask Jesus to be healed. He doesn't know who Jesus is. But he doesn't know who Jesus is after Jesus has healed him. Who told you you could do that? I don't know. The guy who healed me. Well, who is he? I don't know. So he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about Jesus. Jesus initiated the conversation. Do you want to get well? Which I think is an ironic question because he's been there in the invalid for 38 years. What do you think he wants? Of course he does. That's why he's there. It's why he's fighting to get in the water. He wants all of this. He didn't ask for help. This is a man who's lost hope. This is a man who's not even trying anymore, it seems, because he's been there for so long. Verse 8, get up, take your bed, and walk. A statement of healing. Again, he's already done this in the last miracle. Go, your son will live. It's a statement of healing. So this is, this is as God creates the created order by the words of his mouth. This is Jesus recreating what's broken in the created order. By words spoken alone, he can heal anyone and anything. Verse 9, and at once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. So his healing is proven. It's legitimized. He can take up his bed and he can walk. So what's interesting about this healing is there is no faith on the man's part. He's not healed because of his faith, which is typical in Jesus' miracles of healing. So let's look at a couple. Turn back to Matthew chapter 9, just so we can see how it typically goes. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 22 This is the woman who has the issue of blood. She's been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Uh, turn over to Matthew 13, verse 58. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Mark 6 says the same thing. Uh, so as he is in awe. He marvels at their unbelief. And because of their lack of faith, he cannot do uh, the miracles he wants to do. So typically, Jesus is healing in response to people who have the faith to do that. Uh, that is not true with this man, uh, which shows this whole idea of you, if you just have enough faith, the Lord's going to heal you. That's absolutely not the case because that's absolutely not true here. So the emphasis then of this miracle is not on this man's faith. The emphasis is on Jesus' power. He can do it with, a, with or without you. He can heal you whether you believe in him or not. He can heal you whether you know who he is or not. He has that power. Again, the emphasis is on his power to do whatever he wants to do. So this incredible thing has happened 38 years. This man hasn't moved. He can't get up and walk away. Uh, there's all kinds of issues associated with that. Um, he's relying on people to bring him food. How does this man and where does this man use the restroom? There's all kinds of issues that you have to, to wrestle with with this man being an invalid for 38 years. And instantly it's over. And he gets up and he's, ready, he's going home. And in response to that, this amazing miracle that everyone can celebrate and verify what do the religious leaders do? They start barking that it's the Sabbath. You can't do that. It's the Sabbath. It's Saturday. That's a no-no. Can't do that. How, how completely ridiculous. Uh, you can't do this on the Sabbath. 
you can't take up your mat and walk on the Sabbath. Well, here's the thing. No such Old Testament law exists. Honoring the Sabbath, yes. You can't carry your mat on the Sabbath, no. That one doesn't exist. This is the Jewish oral tradition that is recorded in what's called the Mishnah. It's a Jewish rule book, for lack of a better term. And in the Mishnah, Jews believe there are 39 activities that were explicitly forbidden on the Sabbath. One of them is carrying any item from one place to another because that, that equals work, and you can't work on the Sabbath. So this is not the breaking of Old Testament law. This is the breaking of their tradition and their religious legalism. So Jesus is confronting their religious hypocrisy. He's confronting their ultra-legalism. Uh, that's the problem, is they have taken their traditions and equated them to be the same as God's authoritative law. That's the problem, which is why Jesus did nothing but fight with the Pharisees, uh, because their law was equal to God's law, and Jesus simply teaches that is not the case. Uh, verse 14, so again, he has the interaction with the, uh, the Jewish leaders. Who told you you could do that? I don't know. Is this the guy that healed me? Well, who is he? I don't know. Well, he runs into Jesus again in verse 14. See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. It almost sounds like he's threatening him, doesn't it? Now, I healed you. Now, you get this right, because if you don't, I'm going to come back, and it's going to be worse for you. Uh, so that, that's not what Jesus is doing. Sin no more. Now, that may indicate that his suffering, whatever it, you know, this 38 years worth of suffering, it may indicate that that suffering was caused by some sin in his past, that his disability was caused by the natural consequences of something stupid he did 38 years ago. He sinned, he did something he wasn't supposed to do, there are natural consequences to that, and could it be that, that perhaps that's what's happening? Now, Jesus is not teaching that illness is caused by sin. He will uh, disprove that one in chapter 9 the man born blind. And the disciples ask, remember the story? Uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? Now, remember, the man is there, and we'll deal with this when we get there. The man is standing there. He's blind. He's not deaf. Who sinned? Did this guy sin? Like, is this his fault? Is this mom and dad's fault? And Jesus says, no, that's that's not the case. This is so that God's glory can be shown in what Jesus is about to do. So illness isn't necessarily caused by sin, but illness and disability can absolutely be caused by the natural consequences of your sin. Um, you know, my, my father has dealt with cancer for seven years now, um, on and off and multiple surgeries and still trying to figure out what's, what's causing all these issues. My dad smoked for 50 years. Natural consequence of your foolish decisions equal this. So can he say, man, I just got a, a bum rap. You know, God's out to get me. It's like, no. No, this is what you did. Like, th there's a direct cause and effect here. Not that we're heartless about that or, or any, anything at all, um, but, but this, is, this is how it works. Now, on the flip side of that same coin, uh, the Bible does at times tie illness to sin. Uh, I've got these verses here for you, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, Paul tells the church in Corinth, uh, hey, you're not honoring the Lord, you're not honoring the body when you take the Lord's Supper together. And he says, that's why some of you are sick and dying. Because God is, is punishing you for your sin. And you need to wake up and pay attention to that. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 15 says essentially the same thing, that it could be that the Lord is using a sickness, that he's using an illness or a disability to get your attention due to confronting your sin. God has every right to do that if he wants to um, because he's already told you what not to do. And if you continue to go that route, God reserves any right to use whatever means necessary to get your attention. Notice what he did in the Old Testament with Israel and Judah. 
The Assyrians destroy Israel. The Babylonians destroy Judah. Why? Because that was punishment for their sin. All these people died. They got carted off in exile because they wouldn't listen. And God said, if you don't listen, this is going to happen. And they didn't listen. So it happens. It's how God works. He reserves the right to do that. Sin no more or something worse may happen to you. This is an invitation to salvation. Something worse may happen to you. He'd been healed. He did not have faith in Christ. You think disability for 38 years is bad? All that you're looking forward to is eternal destruction in hell. You don't have faith in Christ. You don't even know who Jesus is. That is far worse than any illness or disability you've ever dealt with. So he's confronting this man's sin, letting him know the truth. Sin has really bad consequences, eternal death. Now, verse 16, again, they, here's what Jesus says, you know, sin no more. The man went away, rats Jesus out to the Jews. Verse 15, it was Jesus who did it. Verse 16, this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. The verb tense tells us that it's an ongoing persecution. So this isn't a one time that, hey, they didn't like what Jesus did, so they persecute him for doing it. This is why the Jews continually persecuted Jesus. Um, he, he, and oddly enough, Jesus is the one who's actually fulfilling the Old Testament law, doing good on the Sabbath, loving your neighbor well, initiating good things in the lives of the people around you. Jesus is the one who's honoring the actual Old Testament command. It's the Jewish leaders who are the ones who are actually betraying and dishonoring the Sabbath by saying, you can't, we're not even going to celebrate your healing. You can't carry that mat. They're the ones who are actually causing the problem. Verse 17, Jesus answered them. So obviously they have confronted Jesus about this. We just don't have record of what they said. Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This is where Jesus draws a clear line in the sand. Uh, th this sentence he gives has some bite to it. This is a claim of divinity by Jesus, and it, that's proven in verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he's calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So those who would claim today, Jesus never claimed to be divine. We can let that go. Um, Jesus' original audience knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They, they interpreted him correctly, uh, that he's making himself equal with God. So back in Genesis 2, shows that God rested. Uh, it's the Hebrew word Shabbat, where we get our word Sabbath. Uh, he rested after he created. He creates for six days. He rests Sabbaths on the seventh. But the Jewish rabbis agreed uh, after the law came that you can't dishonor the Sabbath. They agreed God upheld the universe. God is the one running things. He's making sure the sun rises when it's supposed to and sets when it's supposed to. And you know, Read the, the last several chapters of Job of God's defense of how he upholds the universe and is in absolute control of his creation. They said God did that, but he, he did not break the Sabbath. So he's doing that, but we don't really know how that gets done on the Sabbath because God obviously can't work on the Sabbath, which is goofy. Um, so Jesus says... My father is working until now. You're getting all up on my case for doing a good thing on the Sabbath and this man for carrying his mat. Guess who's working on the Sabbath? The creator of the Sabbath. He's working, and so am I. Uh, we are working on the Sabbath um, just as God is Lord of the Sabbath so is Jesus, which is exactly what Matthew 12, Mark 2, and Luke 6 all say about Jesus. He is Lord of the Sabbath. So he's saying then he has the same authority as the one who created the Sabbath. I can do what he does. 
And he calls God my father. That's a very unique statement, my father. The Jews never referred to God as my father. They would sometimes say our or the, never my, because it linked you too closely with God. Jesus can do that because he is the unique son of God. Chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 1, verse 18. You remember we talked about that word, that he is the one and only son of God. Nobody else in John's gospel is called son of God. Others are called children of God. Jesus is the only son. Now, Jesus says this likely to provoke a confrontation. Jesus is, is kicking sand on their shoes a little bit. Uh, so he's, he's getting them ready for this unleashing of what he's about to teach them in the back half of chapter 5 because he's going to launch into a full-scale argument of his divinity. So he's getting ready to tell us who he is out of his own mouth. So, chapter 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Great verses. And in them, Jesus makes five claims of equality with God. So you know, verse 18 is true. He's making himself equal with God. And what, what Jesus says immediately following that does nothing but declare Jesus is equal with God. Again, John has an agenda. He's trying to convince you who Jesus is. Again, that will, that will come into play more even in the next section. So, uh, number one, he's equal in person. So we already dealt with that one in verses 17 and 18. Uh, my father has been working till now, and so am I. Uh, because we're the same. We're equal in person. I, I have the same authority that the father has. He's Lord of the Sabbath. I am also Lord of the Sabbath. So they're equal in person. Just as the Father is, so is Jesus. Number two, he is equal in works. Uh, back to verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Now, those verses combined with 17 and 18 bring up something we talked about last week, the imminent versus the economic trinity. So 17 and 18 Jesus says, the Father and I are the same. We're equal, on equal footing. In the very next verse, in verse 19, what does he say? He says, um, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what that was. Um, I and the Father are one, same page. The very next verse, I only do what the Father tells me I can do. Well, which is it? Yes, it's both. They are equal equally divine, equally authoritative. That's the eminent trinity. The economic trinity is the son voluntarily submits himself to the ruling of the father. I will only do what the father tells me to do, a voluntary submission to the father. So when he says, I can do nothing, this is not an inability on Jesus' part. 
This isn't Jesus saying that he's incompetent to do what he needs to do to fulfill his mission. All that he's saying is, I can do nothing, is there is a unity of purpose between the Father and I that I cannot violate. I will do what he tells me to do because we have the same divine mind. I'm not going to do something else. I'm not going to violate what it is that we have decided to do. He says, I do only what I see my Father doing. So could it be that Jesus had some sort of ability to see the providential hand of God at work in the events of his everyday life? He sees what his father is doing. So he sees God's work happening in the world. Uh, that Something that would be invisible to us, but could he see that? And I, I think so, and here would be the argument for it. Um, Jesus walks up to the pool at the beginning of chapter 5 that's surrounded by paralyzed and invalids and the ill, and Jesus talks to one of them and heals one of them. Why only the one? Why didn't he heal all of them? Could it be that only that one was ready? That one had the potential. That's the one that the Father wanted to use to initiate this confrontation with the Jews so that Jesus could teach them his identity. So could it be that he's got some ability to look at a crowd of invalids and see the Father go, that one. Ask that one if he wants to be made well because it's going to go well for you because I've set this one up because this is now going to be able to happen and you're going to be able to teach this in John chapter 5. Not that he would have said you could teach this in John 5, but you, you get what I mean. Now, verse 20, for the Father loves the Son shows him all that he himself is doing. Greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. I mean, he just did something pretty cool. He healed a guy who's been an invalid for 38 years. That's pretty fantastic. Greater works than these, which I would argue is a reference to resurrection. I mean, what is greater than healing someone who's been disabled for 38 years? Bringing someone to life, that's, that's greater. That's about as great as you can get. That's going to crescendo in chapter 11 with Lazarus being raised from the dead, and then in chapter 20 with Jesus himself coming back from the dead. And I think that is proven that he's referring to resurrection because look at verse 21. Four, which links it to what he just said. Greater works are coming. Four, as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Greater things are coming, guys. It's not just healing some sick people. It's raising the dead. That's what's coming. So he's equal in works. Number three, he's equal in sovereignty. Sovereign being in charge, ruling over all things. Again, that's, that's verse 21. The Son gives life to whom he will. A clear claim of divinity because life is the sole prerogative of God. He is the only one who's in charge of life and death. And Jesus says, just as God is in charge of life and death, so am I. Again, he's making himself equal. Uh, turn back to Deuteronomy 32. It's always fun to go back to Deuteronomy. It doesn't very often. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel 2 is Hannah's song. Chapter 2, verse 6. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. God is the sole author of life and death. So by declaring, so am I, I, I give life to whoever I will. 
Uh, again, he picks it back up in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Uh, verse 25, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For the Father has life and has granted the Son to have life. Verse 26, so has eternal life. Not will have, we talked about this last week. Present tense, new life. Now eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life starts when you become a Christian. Death is just a, a formality at that point. It's just a gateway. We'll talk about that in a second. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Anyone who's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. New life. You have new life now, meaning you can face the judgment with confidence. Turn back to 1 John. Written by the same guy, so you'd expect there to be some similar themes. There are. So if, if eternal life starts for you now, what then is death? Death's just a transition from this form of life to the next one, and nothing more. So then there's no need to fear it. We don't fear death. We don't fear judgment because we are in Christ. So here's how John puts it. 1 John 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So you, because you have eternal life, you've experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ. That love has perfected you. That love has transformed you to the point now where you're not dominated by fear. You don't live based on fear anymore. You don't even fear death. You don't fear the final judgment. Why? Because the judge that you stand before is the Father who loves you. You don't need to fear that day. Chapter 5, verse 11 of 1 John. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He didn't say so that you would believe that you have eternal life, but that you would know it. A confidence that comes from a relationship with the Lord that, that takes you all the way through death and the final judgment. Uh, verse 25, again, referencing uh, back to John 5, uh, verse 25. Um, An hour is coming and is now here. So he's not talking about some future day. He's talking about now. It is now here. So he's not talking about final judgment. He's talking about those who are spiritually dead now are going to hear his voice and they will live. The ones who respond to his voice will live. He's going to talk about final judgment here in a minute, but that's not what this is talking about in verse 25. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those who hear will live. Those who respond to him live, even though they are spiritually dead now. Verse 26, I think, explains verse 25. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So that truth, that, that he has life in himself, expounds the truth from chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. So this is the doctrine of God's self-existence. 
God was not created. He's always been. He has life in himself. Jesus has life in himself. He is not a created being. Um, I, I was just looking at it today for um, a, a different purpose for some sermon stuff uh, for Sundays. And uh, I read again in, in 20, I want to say it was 20, a few years ago. Um, there was a landmark study that was done by an organization called Ligonier. Uh, where they do what's called the state of theology. And it, it just, it's, it's, it's a theological survey that they do of America. And uh, one of the, the, the positives of it, there, there aren't that many positives in the study. Uh, it just kind of makes you sigh and lament over the state of uh, what people actually believe in our country and what Christians actually believe in our country. Uh, one of the high points is... Uh, 70-something percent believe in the Trinity, which is insane because zero percent can explain that. But, but they, they believe in God who is Trinity. But the majority of those people believe that Jesus was the first and greatest created being, which is a heretical view. That's not true. He is not a created being. He has life in himself. He is self existent. Uh, so this life that Jesus promises is new life now and resurrection at the final judgment. And I've got those verses from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, Daniel 12, referencing um, this eternal uh, final judgment and what God is doing with life there at resurrection. Uh, number four, Jesus is equal in judgments. Again, back to verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. It's another claim of divinity because only God is the judge. Only he has the right to, to judge. Genesis 18, 15, when Abraham is arguing with God about whether God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, if you find 50 righteous people, will you not destroy it? Sure, I won't destroy it for 50. Well, what about, what about 40? Okay, I want to, well, what about what about 30? What about 35? Is that 20? Can I hear 20, 25? How, you know, can I hear 15? And down and down and down it goes. He whittles them all the way down to 10. Um, and apparently he didn't find 10 because God blew up Sodom and Gomorrah. But what, what Abraham says to him in Genesis 18, 25 is, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Are you going to sweep away the innocent with the wicked? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Um, only God is the judge of all the earth. But he's turned it over to Jesus. Look at verse 27. He's given him authority to execute judgment. Why? Because he is the Son of Man. That, that's a direct reference to Daniel 7, 13. Uh, that's not Jesus just saying, I'm human too. I was born from human parents. The Son of Man is a prophecy out of the book of Daniel, which we'll get to here uh, we start Daniel here in just a few weeks on Sundays. It, it, it's getting close, September 20th. It's, it's coming. Uh, and, and the Son of Man, and when you read Daniel 7, 13, is the eternal ruler. He's given dominion forever over the earth. So why can Jesus, the Son of Man, be the judge? Because he's the eternal sovereign ruler over all the earth. That's why. So he is the judge. Uh, verse 29 those who have done, they, they will come out of their tombs. Uh, again, that's the, the, the final judgment. And they will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, it sounds like that Jesus is teaching uh, salvation and judgment based on works. You do good things, you're going to have a good judgment day. You do evil things, you're going to have a bad judgment day. Uh, well, we, we know that's not what Jesus is saying, that judgment is based on our works, because that contradicts everything that John is teaching in his whole gospel that you need to believe to have eternal life. But John has done something great in his, in his gospel where he, he unites belief and works together. Uh, look at chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him 
whom he has sent. You want to do good works? Believe in the Son. You want to be evil? Reject him. The good works that bring about good judgment is the embrace and acceptance of Jesus Christ. The evil works that get you a bad judgment is a rejection of Jesus Christ. Number five, Jesus is equal in honor. Go to verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Um, This is Jesus showing his right to be worshipped. Now, if Jesus isn't equal with God, they should have killed him on the spot because of his claim there that I should be honored in the same way that God is honored. You should worship me like you worship God. That's blasphemy. How dare you declare such a thing, that you are on equal level of worship and honor with God? Yes, because I am God. And and with that, I think Jesus turns their accusations back onto themselves. You know, they've accused him of blasphemy. Uh, that, that's the crime that gets him sentenced to death, is blasphemy. He's made himself equal with God. He turns it back on them by denying the Son. The Jews were the ones who were blaspheming the Father. Because if you honor the Son, you honor the Father. If you reject the Son, if you dishonor the Son, you dishonor the Father. So by rejecting Jesus, they're the ones that have been blasphemous, not Jesus. So that's the five statements of equality uh, with the Lord. So Jesus has been very clear. Um, I I and the Father are one, which he will say verbatim later on in John. So let's look at the last section here, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. For the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? All right, when you get to the first couple of verses, 30 and 31, you see the trial motif coming back out. Remember, John has presented us with a courtroom. Here's all these witnesses that we're going to file in front of you, and they're all going to prove that uh, Jesus is innocent. The world is going to be on trial uh, before your very eyes. That's exactly what, what's happening here. Did you hear how many times the phrase bore witness uh, was used? Uh, it, was, it was everywhere. Again, this is, this is part of the trial. And he says in verse 31, if I bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Why is that? Are we to believe that Jesus can't be believed? Well, that doesn't make any sense. So if Jesus said it, we can't take it as true. We have to dismiss it. No, because he's holding true to this true trial idea. Uh, these verses I have for you, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 19, Numbers 35, say that um, no one 
is to be proven innocent or guilty based on the witness of one person. It's got to be more than one. So, because any one person can say anything they want about another person. It has to be verified with two or more witnesses. So Jesus is simply using their own law and their own legal system against them. Don't believe me, fine, because I'm just one witness, but I'm getting ready to throw a whole bunch of witnesses at you, and then you're going to have to make a decision. So he lists, here are the witnesses. The first one, uh, John the Baptist. He brings him up. You sent to John, he says. You liked John. You marveled in his life. You, You enjoyed him for a while. John had already borne witness to Jesus, hadn't he? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John has already been very clear. I'm not the Christ. He is. I'm just the, I'm just the best man, remember? He's the groom. That bride's his. Uh, he must increase. I must decrease. He, he's the one who's come from heaven. I'm of the earth. Uh, so he's the one sent down to do all of this. So John has been very, very, very clear uh, about who Jesus is. So he's simply saying, you liked John. You listened to what he said. Do you remember what John said about me? So don't believe me. Believe what John said. Number two, Jesus' own works are a witness to him. The end of verse 36, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. The fact that I can do what I can do, the fact that I'm turning water to wine, the fact that I'm raising invalids, been on the ground for 38 years, that should probably speak for itself. You can't do that. I can do that. God sent me to do all of these things, and those very works were attested to by Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we believe that you're a teacher come from God because no one could do what you're doing if he had not come from God. So he's just saying, look, look at the evidence of what I've actually done. Uh, Number three, God himself. God the Father himself has witnessed about Jesus. Verse 32, there's another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. He's not referring to John the Baptist there, though he's going to talk about John. He's referring to one to come. Uh, Verse 37, and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. Um, So yeah, John's own testimony was coming from God. He was sent by God. Uh, so all the stuff that John has said, behold the Lamb of God, it takes away the sin of the world, all of that, that has come from God. Um, chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 1, verse 33, both tell us that John the Baptist was sent by God specifically. So everything John says ultimately comes from God himself. So through John, God has borne witness to him. Uh, really, all of the, the miracles that Jesus did, all of his teaching, all of Scripture, all of that ultimately comes from God. The Father has witnessed to the truth of who Jesus is, but even more so, the specific voice of God himself. Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, it's at Jesus' baptism. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. God himself speaks from on high. That's who this is. So if you want to, don't believe me, Believe the voice that you hear thundering out of heaven because that's telling the truth. And number four, Scripture. His voice, verse 37, you have not heard. Um, A reference to Scripture. You are deaf to the truth of the Bible. And he's he's about to prove that uh, to them. Verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. The Bible is not divine. The Bible doesn't give you eternal life. Bible knowledge doesn't save. It is not divine. It is divinely inspired. It is from God. It it is not God. The Trinity is the Father, the Son, not and the Holy Bible. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who speak to us through the Bible. And the end of verse 39, it is they that bear witness about me. The scriptures, they point to me. So a a study of the Bible 
ought to lead you to genuine faith in Christ. It ought to lead you to obedience to Christ. It ought to lead to a transformed life. Why? Because that's where you meet God. It's God directly speaking to you through its pages. Uh, Verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, meaning I come with the force of his character behind me because a name equals character. I, I come by his authority. I come on his behalf. Uh, Years ago, uh, I had uh, my own full-time administrative assistant. It was glorious. Everybody needs one. Uh, I'll be honest, everybody needs one. Um, We were in a large church. I had a staff of 27 people. We had a lot of stuff going on. I could not come to every meeting. Um, That was with all the staff or just some of the staff, whatever it might be. I traveled a lot, um, which was fun at the time, but really took its toll, but I I did all, so I was gone a lot, so my administrative assistant attended meetings on my behalf, and she had absolutely no authority whatsoever. She's an admin that does a whole lot. She's incredibly gifted, but she's not in the org chart up here. She's in an org chart down here, so she's in a room with everybody who outranks her. Yet, if I wasn't there, and Legia was there, every word she said had full authority behind it because she spoke on my behalf. So she and I would talk ahead of time about a meeting. She would text me. She would call. She would email, whatever it might be. And whatever I sent back, she took into the meeting in my name, you could say. So no inherent authority on her own, but she had mine backing her. So, not that I'm a big deal, but I was in charge of the staff. So, she's there speaking. For, that's what Jesus is saying. I, I'm here for him. So, when I speak, it's him speaking. When I tell you to do something, it's his authority that's saying that, and that is not to be taken lightly at all. And he says, you've rejected me, um, it, he said, if, if another comes uh, in their own name, you'll, you'll accept them. Uh, and that happened. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that, that in between, the, after Jesus' death and resurrection, until the destruction of the Jewish temple in the year 70 AD, there was a string of false messiahs who all came claiming to be the Christ. They're the Messiah. They're the chosen one. And all of them uh, died, were killed, were run off, whatever it might be, and everybody ran to them thinking it was so great. And here Jesus says, you have the real one here, and you reject me, but all these guys coming in their own name with no authority behind them, you'll believe them. It makes no sense at all. Verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. That's about as big of a Jewish slap in the face as you could get. I don't even have to waste my breath accusing you to God. Because Moses, the representation of the law in the Old Testament that you've set your hope on because you're so good and righteous and holy that you can obey all these laws, he's the one accusing you. He's the one indicting you to the Father. He's the one condemning you because you have not met the requirements. Not to mention the fact that Moses explicitly wrote about Jesus. And I've got those verses for you. Genesis 3.15. You will, will, you will strike his heel, he will crush your head. The serpent in the garden. That's the the first gospel. Scholars call it the Proto-Evangelion. First gospel. Um, That you've blown it, there's the fall, sin has come into the picture, but what's going to happen? There's one who's to come. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to undo what Satan has done. It's a direct reference to Jesus. Numbers 21, Numbers 24, Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 is the the prophecy of another prophet like Moses uh, who will come. So Moses explicitly has declared, there's another one coming. So if you reject Jesus, what have you done? You've rejected Moses. You've rejected the entire law. You've rejected the Old Testament that has has talked about me coming all this time. Uh, verse, uh, the end of verse 46, 
for he wrote of me. So I've got all these verses here for you um, that, that lay out. Here's how the Old Testament all points to Jesus. We've talked about that before, so we're not going to uh, go into that again. Um, but the purpose of Scripture, friends, is to point to Jesus, to get you ready for him. So that's, uh, that's the two miracles. That's the big uh, teaching time of chapter 5. And your chapter 5 can be a little confusing. Some of the things they'll say in chapter 6 can be that way as well. Uh, but when you break them down phrase by phrase, you begin to see what he's doing. You begin to see he's building the case uh, to make his point of this is who this man is. So let's just talk for a couple minutes about some possible applications uh, of, of what do we do uh, with some of this. Uh, go all the way back to the end of chapter 4 with uh, this Roman officer, this dad, whose son is dying. He's traveled, he's walked 16 miles to find Jesus, uh, not even knowing if Jesus will even be there, but he happens to intersect his path and he brings the issue, my son is dying, will you come? Uh, Jesus kind of mouths off about seeing signs, please, sir, please come, or he'll die. And Jesus says, go, go live. And the guy has to turn and walk away. How, you know, put yourself in that dad's shoes, how hard it must have been to turn around and walk away and go home in full trust that what this guy said is going to come true. That's tough. So when you bring a problem that you have to the Lord, you're praying about this, you're discussing this with him, you're yelling at him about it, whatever it is that you're, you're doing, bringing something before him, how hard is it for you to leave it with him? Or do you, you bring your problem to him and you bark for a while about whatever problem, I know a coworker, and you know, who knows? Um, and then after praying about that, you say amen, you just take it back with you so you can keep barking about it. You can keep complaining. Um, you can keep being frustrated. Isn't it hard to take something to the Lord and leave it there and turn and walk away from it? Trusting that what he said is going to come true? That's hard to do. And it is a full act of faith to leave and do what he said to do and leave the problem with him. It's the old Charles Stanley principle. Obey God, leave the consequences to him. Let him worry about all of that. Your job is to obey and not figure out what's going to happen on the other side of your obedience. Just obey. He walks up to this invalid at the pool. Do you want to get well? What a crazy question. Yes. Yes. I encounter so many people, and I know that you do as well, that you just want to sit down and, and ask, do you really want to get well? Do you, do you really want a, a change in your life? Do you really want to get better? Because it doesn't seem like you do. Do you want to get well? Because Jesus is the source of wellness. He can be the source of healing, sure. He doesn't ever promise that. We don't, we don't get this guarantee that you know, whatever is wrong, it's going to go away. He might be using it in a very different way. We don't know that. He is the source of life. He's the source of hope. He's the source of peace. He's the one that makes well. So we go to him. Um, reading a, a biography of John Wesley. And fascinating, absolutely fascinating guy. Um, tremendous what he did. Um, John Wesley and his brother Charles both served uh, in ministry. They were priests with the Anglican Church for years and years and years before they actually were converted and became Christians. Um, they knew a lot of religious stuff. They, they knew all the things. I mean, they led churches for crying out loud. Um, but it wasn't until several years in um, that they really, the gospel got through. Uh, Peter Bowler uh, shared the gospel with them. He was the first one to actually share the gospel with them and and tell them um, it is not your obedience and your perfection that gets you to God. It is, it is his grace. Um, he, he wants life for you, and 
And, and one of the things that he told the wrestlers was a, 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 um, the, the marks of being a true Christian are holiness and happiness. He goes, that's what Jesus produces in you. He produces a holiness in you. Um, you want to obey him. You want uh, to to do what he says to do. There's that desire that he creates within you to do that, the enablement to do it. We'll talk about that uh, on Sunday as well. But what he produces in you as well is, is happiness because he's the source of peace. He's the source of joy. He's the source of hope. All of those things that we would equate to the word we use of happiness. Um, so if you are not holy, you are not happy, guess what you're not? You are not a Christian because that's what he produces in his people. Uh, yeah, I think of this, uh, this man who's been an invalid for 38 years. Um, that's a long time to suffer. Don't lose hope because then this one day comes where Jesus shows up. A guy doesn't even know. Speaks a word and he gets up and goes home. So after 38 years of agony, Jesus can turn around in an instant. Um, and he may not want to do it until that day. And it may take 38 years to get you ready for what the Lord wants to do. He wants to do it. You, you just can't handle it. So don't give up hope because you never know what he'll do. Uh, he's given us eternal life now. I mean, how many of us can say we live in that reality every day? That I view my life today as one, one more day of the eternal reality that I get to live in? Um, that the, the holiness and the happiness of eternity permeates my life even now? And how, how, can, how many can actually say that? I, I pray that we can move that direction. Uh, because of that, we can face death. We face judgment with confidence. We're not scared of death. We're not scared of COVID. We're not scared of riots. We're not scared of an election. We're not scared of these things. We don't live based on fear with these things. Why? Because no matter what happens, we're with the Lord forever. Uh, no matter what happens, it turns out really well for you. So it's okay. Um, all of these witnesses that that Jesus lays out, that, that testified to the truth of who he is. Um, do you do that? Are, are you a witness to the truth of who he is? Uh, Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And uh, to no surprise, um, we're going to talk about the Bible and why you should study it more. Um, it, it speaks of him. You want to know him? You want to have a relationship with him? Read your Bible. Uh, don't get caught up in religious experiences. Uh, don't, don't do all these other crazy things in the name of don't seek after em emotional experiences. Pick up your Bible and read it. And he will meet you there. And you will develop a relationship with the Lord through its pages. Um, daily, regular Bible reading, Bible study, coming to things like this, multiple things that are uh, your small groups, classes, all the stuff that, that churches do. There's a reason we do that. And it's not because we're a church and we're supposed to, and we're supposed to take up multiple nights of your week. Otherwise, you'll get, you know, you'll, you'll turn into wretched sinners if we don't take your time. Uh, multiple evenings. That's, I mean, that might be true, but we, we do these things because every environment we can have to expose you to the Bible is good. Every environment that exposes you to the Bible, whether it's at your house or here, is a good thing to be a part of. Um, because as many Bible env environments as possible is good for your soul. Um, every single study ever done about spiritual growth, every single one, unanimously declare regular Bible reading and Bible study is the number one factor that grows your faith. The number one factor. In fact, based on a handful of those studies, now... It is the practice to be involved in that fuels all of the other ones. If you want to pray more, if you want to do other spiritual disciplines that grow your faith, it is the Bible and your engagement with it that fuels you doing all of the other ones. So don't practice all of the other ones just to try to figure out which one works. Start with the Bible first and let it fuel the rest of it. 
because it will grow your soul. And if you are ignoring uh, the Bible or uh, acting as if you already know enough of it, you are only fooling yourself. Um, you are deceiving yourself. Uh, and you are missing out on so very much that you could have of God that you don't currently have. Um, he's given it to us. For crying out loud, you each probably own 10 or more. Some of us have Bible fetishes and addictions, and we have way too many copies uh, of it, digital and print. Um, got them all. Um, and then you can get apps that have, like, all of the translations ever. Tremendous. Um, You've got it, just don't ignore it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, again, the time together and to be able to open up Scripture together. And we know what it does. It, it feeds our soul, um, makes us better. You use it by your Spirit to conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ. What an incredible gift. Um, it's not just a book that tells us facts about you. Um, we meet you there and you form us through it, um, how amazing that is. So thank you for the chance to study it and to dig more deeply into it, and thank you for its truth that engages the mind, but the, the truth as well that lets us know exactly who Jesus is. We don't have to try to figure that out. We can open up and see passages like John 5 where Jesus tells us in his own words exactly who he is so we can have uh, right belief, right faith, in the one true God of the universe. Uh, bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you. See you Sunday.